continues to vote Jerry Thexton, Mirvan. Uh, I'm pleased to be here too. Thank you, Pastor. You and Irina have been so gracious. And we get to have breakfast together in Israel and Ukraine before too long. So I'm excited about that. Uh, Yulia and Nastya, are, are you both here today? Uh, Zovnir, Misha, and Yulia have been friends for probably 15 years now. And it's a privilege to be with you. I have been working in the former Soviet Union in Russia since 1990 and Ukraine since 1994. Um, work with street kids, hospitals, handicapped, elderly, just all kinds of different ministries that God puts us together with some of the... So if you can't hear me, just raise your hand or you'll waste your time while we're talking uh, here. Sometimes I taper off. You know, work with a lot of different ministries. And then over the years, you know, Martin Luther said, if we aim at the cook, you'll hit the king every time. And we found because of the ministries we're a part of, uh, it's led into involvement with the governments. And so that's where the, the uh, prayer breakfast in Kiev has come from. God's doing a tremendous work there. There's also one in Russia, in Moscow. And the one that we're going to in Jerusalem is just their second year. And it's a miracle. It's a Jewish state. And uh, God is doing this wonderful thing. And, bringing leaders of the country together, not churches, but leaders of the country, political leaders, around the principles and life of Jesus. And they believe that God wants to do something in their nation based on his teaching. And, you know, if you follow his teaching, then you begin to know him. and uh, It's making a big difference. Well, Jesus said, uh, according to him, that the two greatest commandments, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. So the fellowship that I'm a part of, we believe that that means relationship is the greatest thing in the kingdom because it's first with God and then with one another. And we know that in that relationship, any kind of relationship you have with God, it's bathed in his love. Um, so 1 Corinthians 13 tells us nothing else matters if you don't love. Your faith doesn't matter. Your ministry doesn't matter. Your giving doesn't matter. Your smarts don't matter. Nothing else matters. So 1 Corinthians 13 says, in the uh, Philip's Bible, it says, if I speak with the eloquence of men and of angels, but have no love, I amount to nothing at all. I'm just making noise. If I have the gift of foretelling the future and hold in my mind not only all human knowledge, so everything that everybody knows and everything that's on computers, and it goes on to say, the very secrets of God, and if I also have that absolute faith that could move mountains, I could tell Mount Rainier to get up over here and move from here to here, and it does it. But I have no love, it says. It amounts to nothing at all. And it goes on to say, if I give everything I possess, if I were to give everything I own to the poor, and it goes on to say, and even my own body to be burned, but have not love, then I achieve precisely nothing. This is a critical issue with God because the essence of God is love. So 1 John 4, 7, uh, excuse me, 8 and 16 says that God is love and the way that you and I are identified as being a part of his family. Tell, Jesus said, is, I'm going to give you a new commandment that you love one another. That's not new. That's in the Old Testament. But he goes on to say that you love one another like I love you. That's something nobody had ever seen before. Dramatically different. It's a new kind of love that he's brought in to our fellowship and our lives and into the world. And he says, that's how everyone will know that you're my disciple. First John 4, 7 and 8, many of you know that. And it just says, brothers and sisters, we ought to love each other because love comes from God. And those who love know God and are born of God. But if you don't love, you don't know God because God is love. And then Galatians 5, 6 says, the only thing that counts is faith working itself out in love. So whatever we do, it's meant to draw us into this loving environment for God. And anything that would hinder that needs to be done away with. We need to take it out of our way because our faith just becomes a rigid religion without love. And we become really uh, destructive in relationships. We get hard and calloused and we begin to move away from the kind of loving, soft relationships in Christ that he won for us on the cross. So I want to do something that, uh, I don't want to be silly, but I want you to try something. You don't have to stand up or anything, but just where you are, if you would lift up your left leg 
and uh, those of you who are able to do that, get it off the ground a little bit, and see if you can make a six with your foot. Give that a try. Okay, your left leg, so your other left. Okay, <laughs> left leg make a six. Got it, how many could do that? You are gifted athletes, I knew you could do this, okay. So now those of you could do a six with your left leg, try a nine with your right leg. Both at the same time. Can you do that? Some of you look a little spastic, but let's keep trying here, okay? So how many could do that, a six and a nine? Good, we've got some extraordinary gifted athletes here. All right, now while you're doing a six and a nine with your two feet, I'd like for you to cross them like this, one over the top and then underneath. Can you do that? While you're making a six and a nine. How many can do that? Because I'd love you to come up and show us how you do that. You can't. And the reason you can't is because you can? Well, come on up. Let's see how you do it. <laughs> and the reason I, I say that, and it's just a silly demonstration, but Jesus said there's something that you can't do and love at the same time. And that thing is to judge. You either judge or you love, but you cannot do both at the same time. So it tells us in Matthew 7, 1 and 2, don't judge. If you judge, you'll be judged. And the measure that you use will be the measure used with you. Well, he's warning us that the thing that we're called to above everything else is the very thing that we'll be unable to do if we hold on to this right to judge other people. And scripture tells us over and over again, it's not just a single uh, scripture that warns us about that, but all of the leaders of the church came to that same conclusion. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 3 to 5, he said, I don't even judge myself. In fact, anyone who thinks they have the right to judge needs to wait until the proper time. And that proper time is when Christ returns. He's the one who's going to put light on everything that's hidden in darkness. And he's also the one that's going to reveal the secrets of each person's heart. But until that time, that's not us. Uh, we can't do that. James goes on to say in James 4, 11 and 12, who are you to dread, judge your brother? There's only one law and one law giver and it's not you. So he said, don't judge one another. Romans uh, 14, 10 to 13 tells us to stop judging our brother and looking down on our brother. We need to move away from that with one another all together and make up our mind that instead of judging, we're not gonna put any obstacle or a stumbling block in, in front of anyone. Lord, help me to know how to be an encourager and somebody that lifts up this person's faith in their life, not someone who's gonna be picking apart the things that I, I deem are wrong. So the critical issue in our faith is to love. And when we wanna know how to do that, Jesus takes us back to the very beginning. He said, these are the two greatest commandments. And if you do these two things, all the rest of the law and prophets are fulfilled, Matthew 22, 36 to 40. And the first one, all of you know, is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. And then he said the second is like it, to love your neighbors yourself. Do you know what it means to love your neighbors yourself? Any guesses? Or anybody not chicken to say something? What it means to love your neighbors yourself is, I want everything for you that I want for me and my family. I want you to have clean water. I want you to have good food. I want you to have a decent place to live. If I have a good car, but I've been saving up money to buy a new one, and I love my neighbor like Jesus is talking about, I'll either give them my good car, or I'll give them money I've been saving up for that new car, because I already have one that works, but you don't. And your family needs one just like my family. And we begin to understand how the early church lived. Acts 2, uh, 42 to 47 and 4, 32 to 37 said they didn't claim that anything was their own. They knew when they came to Christ, not only their lives, but everything they possessed was his. And Lord, I hold it like this so it can never overwhelm me. And it's yours anytime you need to use it for someone else. Instead of grabbing on like the world does and showing off that I have more than you have, I know that my brother is gonna be taken care of and he'll see the love of Christ in something that's so different than all the rest of the world. Jesus said, if you're one of my followers, though, and you're serious about doing that, 
It's even more difficult than loving someone as much as you love yourself. I want you to love more than yourself so that you would choose others over yourself when you're decision making. How many know uh, John 3.16? Anybody know that? You're hiding your hand. Some of you are doing this. How many know? Anybody ever heard of that verse before? All right. Anybody feel good enough about it that they would be willing to recite it for us? Pastor? For God so loved the world, he gave his only son that we might not perish but have everlasting life. You've heard that before? Okay. So, Pastor, I have a gift for you. This is a really cool pen from our church, and it has a light on it. And it's yours. You're welcome. Our church's name is Salt and Light. We've been trying to figure out how to put salt in the other end, but so far not yet. So, John 3.16. So what does 1 John 3.16 say? Anybody know that? I have a gift for you if you know it, without peeking. It's probably just as important for us as John 3.16. 1 John 3.16 says, and this is how we know what love is, because Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for one another. He tells us how far we need to go. And if we're really serious about following Jesus, he said even that's not far enough yet. You think, well, how much further can we go in this? And he says this, it's easy enough to do it for someone you love or for your neighbor, but how about somebody who hates you? So in Luke 6, 27, 28, he said, listen to me, all of you who are within the sound of my voice, you need to love your enemies. You need to do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Uh, uh, bless those who curse you. But Jesus is saying something the world has never heard before. All of these things that sound so extraordinary, even for family members or for people that we love, he says, you need to learn how to do that with your enemies. And this is what separates out our faith from everything else in the world. Nobody else asks that. So I've been uh, pastoring for a long time, full time for about 40 years, and as Pastor mentioned, and I preached about love a lot because love's in the Bible, but then I had to quit because it wasn't working, and I, I just became discouraged as a follower of Jesus. But I'd preach about love in the morning, and then I'd go home and I'd be grouchy with my wife, you know, like how come we don't have anything for lunch, or why is it ready right now? And, I'm thinking, wait a second, you know, and she'd say, and what did you preach about today? Uh, we've had people go out in the parking lot after the service, we're talking about love, and they, their cars hit each other, and they wanted to fist fight. And I'm thinking, this doesn't work. We, we can sound good on Sunday, but then we forget. And so I quit preaching about love for quite a while. And I, I figured if this is not true, then we ought not to tell people about it. And I, I was kind of grieving over this one time, and the Lord said, that's because you've been preaching the wrong kind of love. And I said, well, I th thought there was only one. And he, he said, not even close. Have you heard the expression, the difference between apples and oranges? You know, it, we say that oftentimes. It means that they're so unlike each other, they have no connection at all. And God begins to teach us about his love. So the world's love is temporary, it's conditional, and it's selfish. I'll love you as long as it's profitable for me. But whenever it's not, or I don't think you deserve it anymore, maybe you've lied to me or cheated me out of something, or maybe you're a threat to my family. Whenever I think you don't deserve my love, then I can bail out on that. Or maybe I just think there's somebody else I like better, so I don't need to love you anymore. And this is common in the world's love and too common in the church. God says it's like an orange and uh, we have our heart in here, and it's been hurt by people who've lied to us or cheated or hurt us in some way. And each time that orange gets hurt, our heart gets hurt, it's like being stabbing another hole in it. And oftentimes what I was preaching before is just stick a Band-Aid over that. You know, quit the leaking from going on here. And, and uh, so I had this ugly old heart that was all shriveled up and full of holes and bandages all over it, and I was trying to carry on healthy relationships with people, and it didn't work. And one day God said, that is the ugliest looking orange I have ever seen. That is one ugly heart, you need to get rid of it. Don't try to fix it, it'll never work. So he just said, throw it away. 
Say, I've got a better plan. God's love is unconditional. It's eternal, and it's self-sacrificing. And it tells us in Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27 that he'll give us a new heart. He said, I'll put a new heart in you, and I'll remove the old one that's like stone now. It's been so beat up that it's hard as a rock. And I'll put my spirit in there, and Romans 5, 5 says, then the Holy Spirit pours the love of God into that heart. Now we, we have something that's completely different than anything in the world. You can't earn it. It's like salvation. Uh, it's something only God can give. And it's something that needs to be renewed continually. So Ephesians 5.18 says, be filled with the Spirit. And in Greek, the word means continuously be filled. It's a never completed action. It's called an imperfect present. Be filled right now. And be fi- fulfilled. Uh, be filled. Ongoing. Keep doing that. Somebody asked a pastor in the 1800s by the name of Dwight Moody, D.L. Moody. They said, well, why do we need to keep getting filled up? And he says, because we leak. Um, there's things that happen to you during the day that will start to steal that love away. But when we begin to understand what God's doing, then he teaches us everything that we do throughout the day. This is where I want you to bring my love into it. It's the one thing that you have empowered by the Holy Spirit that can change everything. So you go into a difficult relationship or you're just coming home at the end of a busy day or you go to the grocery store or whatever you do, pray it, God, would you teach me how to love like Jesus loves? I want to be ready for that and I want to be open to that. And I'm tired. It's been a long day. And unless you give me a fresh supply, I'm not going to do well. And he begins to bring us to this new place where this is always in the front of our mind. and God brings power in with that to change everything. He makes us a conduit. So Jesus said in John 7, 37 to 39, he said uh, on the great day of the feast that they had there, he said, if anyone is thirsty, in other words, if you don't have enough. I wrestled for a lot of years, and, uh, and I usually dropped, often dropped in college, down about 20 pounds uh, to my wrestling weight. The first 14 or 15 was just dieting really hard, but the last six or seven was always water. I mean, I didn't have anything else to lose, so I would measure my water out in a teaspoon, and I I would be so parched that I could hardly speak, you know. But that's the way I got my weight down so I could wrestle in the class that I was in. Um, And so I know what it's like to be really thirsty, and Jesus said, if you've ever experienced that before, or if you're just out of gas, and you dried up inside. He said, come to me, drink from me. He said, just like it says in the scriptures, liver, uh, rivers of living water will flow out of you. In other words, so much that it's all you need and more to splash on everybody around you. And it goes on to say, and this comes from the Holy Spirit who lives in you and brings this love that we're talking about back into the picture. When we do this, Uh, then, like I say, all of the relationships and circumstances around us begin to change. When you judge, when I judge, it's like putting bricks in your heart, and it stops up this conduit. So God wants this, excuse me, this big conduit, this big pipe, to be connected between heaven and every place you go and every relationship you have. And he just says, I just want to rush this living water through you to all these dear people around you. And he said, but if you block it up with judgment, it begins to slow that down and you can go so far that it doesn't come out at all. And you dry up. And people around you begin to dry up. And life isn't very fun anymore. So God brings us back. And if love weren't the critical issue, then God could have just sent leaflets for us. You know, he just dropped some leaflets from the air like this and just say, turn or you're going to burn. But he didn't. He says, God so loved the world that he gave. This is how he went after us. And this is how he's telling us to go after each other. Sometimes when I'm speaking about these things, people say, well, so do you just love and then it doesn't matter what people do? That's not true. So the judgments that God has pronounced, those uh, are not disputable. It's never going to be right to lie or to steal or to be immoral. Um, God says these are wrong and the penalty for that is going to end up in death. So I can't change that, and you can't change that. But what God's talking about in the scriptures and what Jesus tried to teach 
is that we don't add our judgment to it. So I work with some prisons in Ukraine, some of the hardest people in the world. And I've always been touched because a lot of times when we're talking, their response is, I'm glad I went to prison. That's where I met Jesus. Um, and I didn't know this the first 10 years or so that I worked in the prison, but you know, they've got the guys who are just kind of petty crooks near the front. And then the guys who do the pretty bad stuff behind them and then the worst stuff behind them and worse. And finally, the very back, you know, near the very back, they have the murderers. And I've been with guys who killed at least 15 people and, you know, at one time bragged about this. And then behind them is the one that nobody will talk to or be with, and it's the child molesters. And uh, they're completely isolated, and if they're not protected all the time, they're hurt badly. And uh, they're just terrified in and there. I guess one of the things that I've learned over the years about that is that if God's made a judgment on something, we know that that stands. But if you add your judgment to that, it completely nullifies any kind of impact that you're going to have on their lives. Uh, if you don't love, you aren't the one that's going to be able to teach them about Jesus. Because God is love. So we don't disqualify what they've done. These things are horrendous. I mean, no matter what chair they're sitting in. But we've kind of come to understand that uh, I have failed as much as anybody. And somehow God has forgiven me and he's given me a chance again. And I want them to have the same chance I've had, to know Jesus. And when I love them, and they, they know that, they know if you're speaking down to them and, and you're looking at them like in Romans 14 that tells us, we belittle them in our, our own sight, in our own eyes. Uh, you have nothing to offer them, and they won't listen to you. I've been going back and forth now for nearly 20 years to the Soko, Sokiani prison in southern Ukraine, one of the worst ones ever, and God has done a miracle there. They have a church right in the center of the compound, and guys will come from all over to be a part of that, all kinds of different denominations, and the prison leadership has given them permission to even miss work so they could come to worship. Uh, it's just changed so many people. They, when they get out, many of them have become pastors and leaders in their churches and have been restored to their families and all of that. If we thought that they were already too far for Jesus to do anything with, and why should we love them? Uh, there would be no hope. So God says, if, if you don't love, don't try to represent me or serve me. This may sound a little wild, but I tell people, don't even share your faith. If you don't love the people that you're talking with, it's not God's gospel. It may be just a religion. You know, you just throw them a, maybe the four spiritual laws and tell them, you're probably going to hell anyway, but read this, you know. That doesn't go very far with people. But when we start to walk in love like he's in love, then Christ, they see Christ in you. And we don't always need to talk. They see this work of Christ that he's done in your heart and your eyes. You know, Augustine said, preach the gospel, and when necessary, use words. And when we are given the opportunity to share what we've walked in the love of Jesus Christ, then they can see his power and his love, and not just words. And it begins to reshape hearts, give them a chance at a brand new heart. In fact, and then you become the one who takes the fragrance of Christ everywhere you go. When you're coming home at night, when you go to work, when you go to school, when you go to the grocery store, when you go to the dry cleaners or the gas station, you're the one that stands out. It tells us in Philippians 2.14 that you will shine like stars in the universe. You'll be so different that you won't only look different here on earth, you'll look different to those heavenly beings who are watching you, and standing guard over you, and they'll say, who is like this one who knows how to love like Jesus loves? And he's taken the gospel to the world because the Holy Spirit is bringing the power to change lives. So I want to close with uh, four last verses. We okay? Okay, great. So four last verses, if you're doing any writing down or whatever, uh, the first one is out of 1 Corinthians 16, 14, and it says, do everything in love. And the next one is out of 1 Corinthians 13, 8, and it says, love never fails. You may be confused and not sure what the next step is, but if you go back to square one and start loving like Jesus loves, it begins to get unraveled 
and get clear very quickly. 1 Peter 4, 8 says, above all else, love each other deeply from the heart. And finally, the last one is 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And most of you are familiar with this too. It says, in this life, there are three great lasting qualities. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Bork Lubitvas. Amen. Thank you, brother. May God bless you and your ministry. And uh, thank you for all the work that you're doing in, in the Slavic side of the world as well. God bless you in that. Um, friends, right now you have an opportunity to respond to what you've heard and respond to the grace of God in your life. And so I'd like to have the ushers come forward uh, and be prepared for that. We'll pray and uh, we'll, have, we'll have the worship team lead us lead us through a closing song. Uh, friends, if you're here for the first time or if you're not uh, a member of our church family but you'd like to take certain or make certain decisions in your life and then you walk with Christ, you have connect cards there in front of you. So if you'd like to learn more about the church, if you'd like to be baptized or if you'd like to become a member or if you'd like us to pray about anything in particular or if your address has changed or you have a new phone number, Please take that, that Connect card right now, fill it out, and as the ushers come by, you can drop it off in the offering plate, um, and that would, be, that would be a blessing for us. So let us, let us stand and pray.